Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Web Platform Podcast. Did you miss me? This is episode number 189 developing with vs code we are your host this week justin Ribeiro and leon rebel leon so good to hear your voice again and yours justin i think the uh, the whole internet has missed you um for sure <laughs> <laughs> oh you are too kind which is you know you, you really you're too kind no one has potentially missed me uh you know you all did not need me to sit here and you know wax quixotic about random things so many good episodes while i was gone i'm jealous <laughs> always glad to have you back <laughs> i'm glad to be back you know i've been on the road for quite a bit lately so it's you know it's always interesting because i get new developer perspective i always enjoy developer perspective about sort of how people work uh which is great because we're talking about vs code today so uh, i think it'll be interesting it'll be an interesting conversation uh but before we kick that off i'm going to throw it over to leon who's going to talk about this week in the web in two minutes or less leon Thank you, Justin. So first of all, Node.js 12 has been released, which includes a whole host of new goodies, including an upgrade to the version 8 JavaScript engine for speed and performance improvements, TLS 1.3 support, experimental ES6 module support, further improvements to worker threads, and much, much more. So check out the link to find out all of the details. There's been a new feature release of Puppeteer, the headless Chrome Node API. This release includes loads of bug fixes and an upgrade to Chrome 75. Safari Technology Preview 8 is out, so loads of new stuff here, um, such as uh, the Resize Observer, improvements to WebGPU, and much more, so check out the link to find out all the details for that one as well. Uh, if 3D graphics is your thing, then you'll be happy to hear that Babylon.js 4 has been released. So Babylon.js is one of the leading JS graphics engines based on WebGL, um, and in version 4, the entire code base has been moved to ES6 uh, modules, which is providing up to 80% smaller download payloads, which is really cool to see. And then don't forget that as a listener to the Web Platform Podcast, you can get 15% off tickets to Amsterdam JS Nation. Um, this is a stellar JavaScript conference, which is happening in June this year with speakers like Kyle Simpson, Henry Zhu, and many more. So use the discount code Web Platform Podcast to get that 15% off. And that's everything from me for this week in web. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Leon. It's good to know that the web continues going forth, even though I have probably haven't been on. I've been so not <laughs> <laughs> like connected to the web very much uh, in terms of the, you know, the pulse, the news feed and things. So it's good to hear the, you know, what's going on. So this week, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we're talking about VS Code, developing with G VS Code and for VS Code. There's so many interesting things we can do with VS Code these days. Uh, we've had Kenneth, who's a PM over on VS Code uh, on the show previously. And today we have Ahmad. Ahmad, welcome to the show. Thank you sir, for joining us. Thanks a lot for having me, Justin. So for those out there who don't know you, uh, introduce yourself. Tell the world, tell the internets about yourself. Uh, thank you. So I'm Ahmed Oves. Uh I'm actually a full-time open sourcer. I love the web and the web platform podcast, obviously. <laughs> uh, and I recently became a Google developer ex expert. But beyond that, I have been working in the community community for Node.js Foundation and have been contributing code as a core contributor to the WordPress core for like over a decade or so. So uh, all about JavaScript and developer relations and mostly interested in doing all sorts of web. And especially about VS Code, I've actually built a theme called Shades of Purple, <laughs> uh, no pun intended. Uh, it's like the third most popular theme on the VS Code marketplace. And I actually put out a course, VS Code Pro for power users as well. So that's me. You've been around the intertubes for many, many years, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, uh, what brought you to sort of uh, the web uh, the first place you know i you know leon and i and danny and you know, everybody on the show we talk a lot about origin stories uh because i'm always curious like how did you get started on the web because you you you've built a lot of stuff over the years <laughs> <laughs> well uh there's ni uh, a nice story there actually so i used to be always interested in uh, you know sort of programming because uh there are like 17 engineers in my family <laughs> and all of all of them most of them are like electrical engineers but i for when was like when i was a kid back when i was like 11 years old i started getting into like 
Python script shells for Nokia Symbian devices and whatnot. But all of that was like, you know, closed source and you, you could do, you know, much less than what you could do in, you know, web now. So most part of uh, how I became a web developer was because of, you know, open source, uh, you know, parts of it. There was this uh, PHP BB forum script that I got uh, inspired with and I started an online forum and it was about WordPress. So naturally I transitioned towards developing WordPress websites. All of that was unintentionally, you know, I, I didn't know that I was going towards open source, but everything that I later on picked on were all, all, was all about open source. And naturally uh, I found my way into the web because of open source. So I think I'd say uh, having a lot more of free and open source software in the web circles was the prime reason for me and for many of my friends who got attracted to, you know, developing for web instead of mobile or other platforms. Yeah, you've you've reached a lot of developers. I mean, you've worked, you know, you've mentioned you've worked on WordPress. Uh, you, you've just, you've sort of been everywhere that I, I've seen you pop up just in random places that I have a tendency to just to fall into. So I, I <laughs> you know, it's nice to have you on the show. Finally, I feel like you should have been on the show years ago. And you know, you're just too busy. You're just always running around, you know, reaching millions of developers and whatnot. Uh, and, and today we're talking about VS Code. Uh, and I'm so you were a Sublime user, were you not? Uh, as I think Leon and I both were as well. Um, still love Sublime. I have no problem with Sublime. But VS Code has, yeah. has been quite the transition point, would you say? <laughs> exactly. So I was like, uh, you know, back in the day when I was uh, graduating, we, it was all about Notepad++. Plus so, Plus. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah. But when Sublime came into, you know, uh, I think it was like 2010 or 2009, and Sublime was this hot new editor and it was super fast and it was everything I personally wanted it to be. I didn't want, uh, for example, I was one of those developers who would just console log their way out of debugging <laughs> a situation. So uh, Sublime was that, a, you know, a quick uh, piece of software based on Python and everything. It was fun to use and I actually used it, I think, for over a decade or so. But but. But now, since JavaScript has grown a lot, and uh, I, uh, we, you know, uh, it's it's hard to imagine a project which is not using, you know, like Prettier or TypeScript, and there are all sorts of fun things coming around, like GraphQL, which is not really a standard, but it's something completely new. But when I was trying to configure all of that and uh, add to that mix ESLint along with PHP, since I also work with WordPress, I was always having some sort of trouble with Sublime Text. And I was, you know, constantly uh, contemplating that maybe it's time now that I move on from this editor towards a complete full-blown IDE. But I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, feel like I was flying a, uh, flying a plane and everything, you know, all those buttons and that massive interface that IDEs throw at you is just so, you know, uh, uh, confrontal for me. I, I, so that is actually when VS Code uh, uh, came into being. And it was awesome to see something uh, in the middle of two, both of these. It's not really an ID, but uh, technically, it, I actually think it is an IDE. It has a debugger. And, uh, but, but, but it feels like, uh, it definitely feels like uh, a editor, not an IDE. And for me, uh, that was the selling point plus add to it that moving towards VS Code was extremely easy. One of the things that nobody actually nowadays has time for is, you know, uh, configuring all of those keyboard shortcuts and learning all of those new keyboard shortcuts to go with a new, completely new editor. So one thing that I think early on VS Code did right was having the ability to have, you know, key maps for different editors. For example, I switched in towards VS Code within a day. And it, it just took my keyword shortcuts from Sublime Text and applied it to VS Code. That was amazing. How quickly VS Code became so popular. So it, it was it's outstanding, really, when you kind of think back how quickly it kind of just took over. Um, but I went from Sublime Text to um, WebStorm, which is obviously, you know, a full-blown IDE. Um, 
and you know really really capable and everything but the kind of thing that made me shift from webstorm to vs code was was speed really and and the simplicity of vs code and how it was extensible but you didn't have to have all of the bells and whistles if you didn't need them so um yeah it was a similar kind of situation there i think it, simplicity of it and how kind of customizable it was still so what do you think so obviously we've touched on a few few things there but what do you think are kind of the main reasons why people kind of flocked to vs code um quite quickly um i personally think so so now i'm not a golang developer but i really like oh you know the value proposition of golang it's easy it's simple and there's like one thing one way to do one thing and if you do that you are going to produce code which is going to be very performant similar is the case where you know uh, and, and if you read a little bit about history of go language it actually came out of the frustration of all the other programming languages trying to be uh, you know similar because JavaScript is trying to be python and python is catching up to javascript and that kind of stuff so when i look at the history of other editors for example, WebStorm, PHP Storm, or you know many other editors out there, or even Sublime Text. I think having an extension ecosystem was more of a suggestion to that those uh, IDEs or editors when they were you know actually when they came into being, and it was not a well thought out process. In what I'm trying to say here is, for example, what happened was there was no official you know in official manner a marketplace for extensions for Sublime code. Yes, there are a couple of things like package control, and it was all also you know if 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 someone was just starting out with Sublime Text, they had to you know figure out how to install package control and whatnot. One thing I think that uh, Microsoft here did really well was how they you know uh, captured all of that essence, and they started to take the first step themselves. You know they produced a lot of you know important extensions on their own and uh, they didn't make all of it part of vs code for example uh, emmet comes built in but if you are looking for docker support in vs code you have to install a docker syntax extension and that came from microsoft so you can already trust it and when microsoft actually ended up uploading that extension or for example debugger for chrome extension they you know they made a great use case for github uh, the readme was awesome all of those had not only the images, the screenshots for you know how the extension works, but there were also GIFs, which for me, uh, as a community developer, as a developer advocate, was amazing. And that actually, I think, helped set uh, the right pathway for how the marketplace is right now. Everyone looked at how they were doing it, and that inspired them to do it that way. For example, if you just search for a VS Code extension, the probability of having it a screenshot and you know uh, instructions about how you can use that extension is very very high as compared to many other editors on the market. For, uh, so that 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 was actually the first thing that I've, I've found very interesting. Similar to that was how I moved towards WordPress. For example, Joomla was asking you to upload your plugins and whatnot through FTP, while WordPress, you know had this awesome <laughs> plugin uh, architecture where you would just install uh, plugins right in there. So similarly, I think uh, VS Code evolved from that same concept, but they did a lot of things right. I like to call it that they did open source right, regular open source updates, and how transparent those updates were, what they were working on was, and how they built a huge amount of ecosystem of extensions on their own instead of just relying on the community and how that inspired the community to actually act on it. And they actually started building the extension in the very same way. The extension community uh, really took off, I, I think, within VS Code. And it goes to say uh, the, the architecture they designed within VS Code to sort of uh, not only just make VS Code better, but make other editors better. I mean, their language server setups uh, which are basically interchangeable uh, in most other editors, uh, I think really grew a user base out of, oh, well, I can switch back if I need to because I can just wire, <laughs> I can wire the TypeScript lang uh, into Sublime without any issue or I can use XYZ lang uh, support. Uh, do, do you think that, uh, as Leon mentioned, I had I, written stuff in VS Code before uh, and worked on other 
folks' plugins on the open source. Do you find that the plugin architecture is somewhat easy to get started with? Um, I found it, I mean, the language side is uh, is a bit of a rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> there's a really particular way you have to debug it uh, from a you know contributor standpoint. But did you find sort of working within VS Code on sort of the engine and making sort of the next set of plugins and those things that make developers sort of uh, experience nice, uh, sort of an easy experience? Or how did you get started in it? Uh, okay, that, that I actually in part agree with you on this thing. So what happened was uh, I, I actually built a VS Code theme because I was I knew that I was going to build a course and I've been contemplating on building a course. I just didn't know what that course was going to be about. But before doing that, I since I'm an engineer and I like to <laughs> over engineer things, I was I had started building a learning management system from scratch, and that learning management system had. Uh, WordPress had its database, so PHP was involved, but all of the front end was JavaScript, uh, service workers, progressive web apps with Gatsby. But there were a lot of microservices that were based on Golang. So when I was working with this interesting code base uh, where I had to deal with multiple languages, I had to deal with similar events. Uh, for example, let's say when a video is ended, there are actions for it in JavaScript that relate to actions in the back end, which is PHP and MySQL based, as well as for serverless functions or for microservices, which are Go-based. So having a single you know, variable would uh, have representation in all of these languages. So when I was using uh, you know, one of the most popular themes out there, like Recula or Cobalt, so I, I found it really amusing that the same action, the same actually syntax, a same variable had different colors in different languages to, uh, for you know one single application. It, 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 my mind was kind of like blown. I, I, I would always struggle with having to you know figure out, okay, where was I in that part of code? And that is actually how I ended up building my Shades of Purple theme. What I wanted to do was, if there is a variable in JavaScript and it has a particular syntax color, that should be the same similar syntax color in Golang for its variable in PHP, in MySQL, or, or every, every other language that was part of that particular project. So out of that frustration, I thought, okay, I had never built a theme for any software out there. So let's see how hard that is. The thing that what made me tech, the thing that actually <laughs> convinced me that I can actually code a theme for VS Code was because it is based on web technologies. It came out of a Monaco editor, code editor for web that you can actually install on your website right now. It has uh, uh, the similar code grammar that actually is being used inside of VS Code, uh, which I think Microsoft used for Azure. So since that is based on web, and I'm a web developer, it uh, it was really in, it was like you can say it was sort of an easier transition towards you know. Maybe I can contribute to the course software VS Code, and maybe I can build, share, uh, you know, a theme, share the purple theme. So I, uh, I started. I looked around at the documentation, which was much better than many editors, other editors that I found. But the thing that really clicked to me was that uh, Microsoft team behind VS Code is really, uh, you know, they are pushing for developer tools and developer experience. And they had built this, you know, uh, a generator just like Create React app that you use for generating, you know, React applications. They have a generator for code, so which you can install with Yoman, and all you have to do is your code, and it will ask what are you going to build. And it, it goes a step further. For example, I chose a theme that I was going to build, and since I didn't want to do it all by myself, it asks actually that if I want to be, you know, base my theme on the basis of another theme that I'm using. So I chose Cobalt. So that is how I found it, that it was super easy. And a couple of hours down the road, I, I had a theme that was not only built because of the help of the you know, VS Code team and their generatable tooling they had built, but not, uh, I ended up submitting it. And all of that process was actually much, much more smooth than I had found in other ecosystems for Notepad++ or for Sublime Text, where marketplaces are like mostly abandoned places. And you know, if you, if you send a pull request, you have to wait like two or three months for your pull request to be you know, merged or whatnot. But with VS Code, in less than 24 hours, I had an idea. Since I was a web developer, I, I was able to build something for my code editor and it was actually available in the marketplace in less than 24 hours. So that 
plugin ecosystem in the thought of that has went into building its architecture and the developer tools and the developer experience around it was all amazing. And uh, I think that that is what the communities has had been looking for. And that is actually one of the, you know, most uh, sell biggest selling points of VS Code. That once you experience the community, uh, you know, the community around VS Code and how actively they are working on it because of the toolings that Microsoft has built around VS Code, uh, you would end up agreeing with that and you would be able to, you know, just uh, change anything. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if you have, you know, actually seen the process of building a custom theme for VS Code, or even just if you are trying to add a keyboard shortcut to the particular context. So what they have done is they have actually built tools inside of VS Code with that come built in, which actually help you to inspect VS Code, just like you would inspect a simple, you know, website with Chrome. And you can actually design it with uh, adjacent based CSS, uh, hex based colors and whatnot. So that is actually, I think, interesting here. So I have not built anything for VS Code before, which is why I was kind of really keen to, uh, you know, speak to you on this episode to kind of learn kind of how the process works. And that sounds really, um, really well thought out. Um, what is the uh, documentation like um, for these kind of things? Is it like, uh, I suspect that the documentation to kind of support these tools and, and uh, the APIs and everything is probably really, really good as well. Is that is that the case? Yeah, it's, it's actually that the case. For example, if you take a look at uh, theme documentation or the reference, you will actually not only find, uh, which, is, which is actually normally, it's very really odd for editors to have pictures or even GIFs or even, you know, uh, release notes that are actually community friendly. But with VS Code, the documentation team is impressive. They, they actually really have a huge open you know transparent open source roadmap that you can start following uh, to see where vs code team is right now how they are solving these issues if you're if you're you know if you're interested in the core development and if you're not interested in that what happens is if you're interested in just building a particular uh let's say vs code extension there are generators for that not only there are generators for that but there are sample extensions available that you can just go on uh, and you know, uh, and try and hit the road running. So not only there is documentation, the documentation includes uh, images, GIFs, the documentation you can easily contribute to. For example, it, uh, often it, what happens when uh, I started working with VS Code, I would find something that the team actually missed in the release notes. And I would contribute that because all of the, the documentation, the docs.microsoft project is actually based on top of GitHub. They're using GitHub as a CMS. So that uh, is very really much helpful for web developers like me who have you know, a very good connection with GitHub and open source. So the documentation is not only being written by the core team members, but also being improved on. And uh, a lot of contribution in the documentation are actually from the community. And that is something that I don't see in other you know, editors. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Um, I think you, you've mentioned a few times already that the reason why VS Code is so popular is because of this um, kind of marketplace and extensibility and how well thought out it has been. Because ultimately, developers were problem solvers, right? We, we, you know, we find problems, we want to solve them. And now we're able to do that in the editor. Um, you know, if we come across problems like you, like you said, with the working in multiple different languages, you found a problem and you could quite easily fix it because um, the the editor was was built with the technologies that you understand. Um, and kind of on that, now I thought it'd be really good if um, uh, Justin, I know you've kind of done a few things with VS Code before. Well, maybe you could uh, uh, kind of mention a few things that you've built um, and kind of describe the the kind of process there. Yeah, no, it's it, it's really not that bad. Uh, I agree that the documentation is really, really good. Uh, the documentation, I know we talk about documentation a lot, but I really love good documentation. Be it, I don't really care where it is. You know, it could be in a tracker, it could be on your site, wherever. Um, as long as the documentation is good, uh, you can build what you need. Because like you said, we're problem solvers by nature, right? It doesn't really matter what the problem is. We generally just want to solve it. Uh, the, the, the stuff that I've worked on in VS Code has, been, has varied quite a bit. Um, you know, I had worked on sort of a snippet engine sort of side of life, you know, for web component stuff, Polymer things, um, sort of to sort of wade into the waters, sort out exactly how 
certain subsystems work within VS Code. Uh, you know, the language subsystem, it took me, the language subsystem took me a little while to sort. Like I had to, I had to dig a little deeper uh, to sort of understand uh, both the debugging procedure for languages uh, as well as sort of the syntax uh, sort of when you're doing those matching so that you get sort of IntelliSense and everything else within it. But once you sort of get over that initial hurdle, which is, again, I find fairly well documented, uh, I, I had, I didn't have to ask anyone questions, which is always a good sign because I will ask anyone questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't care. I, I, I think it's odd to me uh, that people don't want to ask questions. I will ask questions all the time. There are no dumb questions for me. Like if I don't know how it works and I can't find any documentation, I'm going to ask <laughs> because ideally I have something I would like to build and you know, I will question that. But with the VS code side, I actually didn't have to ask anybody any questions. Uh, you know, every once in a while on a pull request, someone would point something out, uh, which is great. Uh, I find that the review substructures that I've worked with other authors has been really, uh, uh, really succinct. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, people have a tendency to take code reviews personally. Uh, the feedback I got was fantastic. I immediately understood. I was like, ah, yes, of course, that does make more sense. I can do that. So again, like it's, it's a whole series of things. Uh, you know, you start off sort of, uh, and I'm not saying one is easier than the other, but you sort of, there are levels of sort of where you want to work within the plugin ecosystem or sort of in VS Code itself. And then from there, you sort of, the the community has been really nice. Like I've had a really good experience so far with everyone who who's either accepted one of my pull requests or had a conversation about or, you know, sort of read the roadmap of where VS Code is going and sort of how, uh, you know, its various pieces are structured. All that stuff sort of works to draw. I, and again, I think that's why it sort of exploded. It seems like the plugin ecosystem went from zero to, you know, a million overnight because it seemed to be, oh, we'll just port some sublime stuff first. And then people ported in like uh, themes, right? Themes were an easy port, like, oh, I got to have my theme. And then people were like, oh, well, I can actually build some other nifty things here that were, you know, slightly more difficult. I'm not saying it was one-to-one. -one. Um, but see, that was the thing, though, is like for, for Sublime, and I don't know if either one of you ever did, I never wrote any plugins for Sublime. <laughs> um, I used Sublime for a long time, uh, but I never, I never found the documentation in a state where I was like, okay, I'll do that. Like, I just, I don't know. Like, it never panned out that way. I always thought that was very odd. Yeah. Uh, I, I will actually add here, because uh, I'm not really a Python developer, but since uh, Sublime was Python-based, and I actually found a way to build a separate, you know, library for uh, Sublime, the documentation was really hard to find. And there's a uh, package controller is like a huge monolithic, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Git repository of all the extensions. And I remember back uh, when I was traveling, I, it took me like two hours to just clone it down. <laughs> so many, many of the community members were just, you know, uh, lose heart in there. So uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. <laughs> exactly. So uh, and and I I never I personally never imagined that I would be building you know extensions and whatnot for my editor. But when I as a web developer, I'm always excited about you know uh, web technology. And uh, as, as I come to think of VS Code, it's actually a huge JavaScript instance, and it knows about JavaScript, <laughs> whatever kind of JavaScript you're running. For example, I don't know how to pronounce that. It's, there's a you know extension called Quokka, which actually is a live uh, scratch pad for JavaScript inside VS Code. And you just you know just you just keep writing code while you are doing a workshop for for a person like me, and it keeps you know. Uh, commenting out things that okay, this line's output is this, and this line's output is that. So it's 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 a better experience to that do that in uh, VS Code, my editor, where I have all of those shortcuts then in you know Chrome DevTools, which I normally used to do. So that actually you know turns out very well for having a, an editor that is written in web technologies. Yeah, it seemed to it seemed to sort of kickstart an entire new set of development from developers who were sort of kept out of the code editor slash IDE game. Because as you said, right, it's it's the technologies we all know. It's the stuff we use on a daily basis. And then all of a sudden you run into a problem and go, oh wait, I I can't fix that. I'm not, you know, I'm not a C dev or I'm not a Java guy. 
uh, all of a sudden now, oh, well, hey, I can actually just dive in here and do this thing. So, you know, it is those, I mean, I think it opened up a, an entire world of, oh, wow, that thing that I once wanted to build, I can build that with, you know, dev tools <laughs> and, uh, you know, and demo that out really quick and go, oh, yeah, that does work. Oh, I can release this as a plugin with <laughs> with one command. Okay. Like all of a sudden, now you've got an entirely new group of folks who, again, to your point earlier, right? The plugin plugin systems have a tendency to win users, right? It, it, it happened for WordPress. Uh, you know, I think, you know, people fail to understand the amount of power shift the plugin architecture within WordPress was and how, oh, yeah. You know, you all of a sudden, oh, I can just install this. Like, I don't need to know anything about a server. I can just go. Like, it just opened up an entire world. And then it opened an entire world of people who started writing plugins. Um, you know, I, I think this is, it just seems, it just sounds to me a, a very similar story with VS Code. Exactly. For example, uh, I have always been a terminal junkie. And I love you having, you know, a strong terminal workflow. And I would not trade it for anything. Uh, but with VS Code, I was able to, con you know, convert my bash scripts into small VS Code extensions. And that was awesome. I would just, you know, uh, click one button and it would do one thing for me. It would generate a debugger script for my, you know, it would con convert uh, my JavaScript debugger workflow to a PHP, uh, you know, debugging workflow in a Jiffy. And there were also, the, uh, for example, there were developers, since it's web-based, uh, many developers found out ways to extend it for other developers who don't really want to write, you know, new VS Code extensions. For example, there is an awesome extension called, uh, I, I think it's called Save and Run. So whenever you save a file, you can run potentially anything. You can run a Bash script, you can run a JavaScript file, whatever you want to do. So in a project that I have been working with, there is this JavaScript developer who actually wrote himself a new form of, you know, uh, AST-based Prettier which actually uh, formats the code like he wants. And all of that is based on simple, you know, node, one single file of Node.js. And he's using that, you know, run and save extension. Whenever he saves a particular file, it is formatted the way he wants. And he doesn't have to, you know, build or configure Pretty or whatnot. So that kind of power is extremely important. It definitely gives you a workflow. Right, it gives you workflow. Uh, custom workflows are underrated. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Leon, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was, I was just kind of jump in and kind of say another really cool um, benefit of VS Code being written in web technologies, meaning that it's really accessible for web developers to actually, you know, enhance the VS Code. For example, um, so all of us here on the Web Platform Podcast are really early kind of web component advocates and users. Um, and pretty much at the early days, all of the IDEs didn't understand uh, kind of template literals or oh, was many, ma many of the specs. So it's, it was always an absolute utter nightmare working with, you know, vanilla web components where you didn't have the syntax highlighting. You'd have, you know, your, your code would just be all one color because the IDEs just didn't know, like, what is this? What This is not JavaScript. So um, when you come across those, those kind of problems where you're kind of playing around with experimental web APIs or experimental or really early um, web specifications very quickly and easily, um, you end up getting, uh, you know, proper syntax highlighting for these things, even if they're not officially in the platform yet, just because of how easy it is to extend VS Code. So that will hopefully become a thing of the past, thanks to um, how easy it is to kind of, uh, yeah, update and enhance this thing. So that's another really cool reason, a really good thing for, for VS Code being written into web technologies, because we can easily, um, you know, solve problems like that, which I think is huge. Um, and it wasn't long until we uh, got, you know, full syntax highlighting for all of those things in web components, which is really cool. Yeah, I, I would like to agree with that and combine it with what Justin said, the language, uh, plugin language, grammar thingy, which is actually very complex. But uh, I personally, what I do is I have uh, I don't use any SaaS services to keep, you know, like uh, my secret keys and whatnot. I've actually built around a cool uh, custom workflow for keeping my keys and encrypting them and whatnot inside of Dropbox. And it all of that is based on a Zish script that I have written. But with VS Code, I have actually been able to, these are things that I never thought that I would be able to, you know, uh, have time to build or I would be, even have the skill to build it. But with VS Code, I have this, you know, extension, for example, sumkey.aa 
is like initials of my name, Ahmed Awais, and that I have been able to associate .aa files with a particular grammar that I personally wrote for VS Code. And while it was a bit of a struggle, but with, just like Justin said, I hadn't have to ask any questions or whatnot. And I was able to build a custom syntax highlighting and grammar for a file that does not, you know, is not recognizable in any other editor. This one thing actually stops me from moving to any other platform. So having this kind of power for, and, you know, uh, having this kind of, uh, I, I, I personally feel that VS Code has enabled me to become a better developer. I have started to understand uh, language grammar and just by looking, since I built that shades of purple theme, just by looking at a particular color, even before, you know, my runtime debugger or TypeScript printer, I know that I have done some, something wrong. And all of that is because of uh, how VS Code has enabled me to do things based on my particular skill set without learning something new and still contribute to the community. And as far as the you know community part goes for VS Code, I have spent like 13 years with, v, uh, with WordPress and I've built a number of WordPress plugins. And they're like uh, about five, uh, about half a million websites actually use my plugins. So that is a huge number, you know, that I'm proud of. But last year, when I actually wrote this VS Core theme, Shades of Purple, uh, I think the last time I checked, about 1.2 million developers have downloaded that theme. So uh, that that blows me away. That actually blows anything open source that I've worked on out of waters. Those stats are amazing. It actually makes me understand that the community really cares about VS Code extension system, and that cares in the deep. Uh, compassion for VS Code uh, extension library actually comes from uh, not having to learn new skills and just using whatever you already know to build on top of it. Yeah, I think that, I mean, we are sort of in an interesting sort of inflection point when it comes to the way developers sort of work today. Because workflows have a tendency to vary in so many places and trying to keep them straight uh, was always a challenge. I mean, I, you know, I've been on the road a lot lately, so you see a lot of different workflows. And the interesting thing is, is that when you have extensible editors, you can get around a lot of the sort of developer pain that comes with how is this supposed to be uh, how am I supposed to work in, how am I supposed to be productive in this project when I first come on? Because it's, it, 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 it used to be, oh, I have to set up 27 million tools and, oh, you know, they have to be global, but some of them aren't global and some of them go over here and wait, was that one installed by NPM? Oh my gosh, I have a conflict. And then you go into an editor and then like Leon was saying, oh my gosh, it's all one color. I can't read any of this. <laughs> um, Okay, well, what about this? Okay, well, no, I'll install this one. Okay, that one doesn't work anymore because that was for an old version of the grammar. Okay, well, wait, about what about this new one? And when we sort of started to go through and define what those sort of build out that stuff, because it's not that editors and IDs haven't existed, right? We've always had them. But the problem is, is that there was a, I, I think there was a significant amount of pain there uh you know depending on you know it was i don't know if you guys ever used eclipse so you guys ever use eclipse <laughs> uh, for a little bit. yeah so i i was a i was a pretty heavy eclipse user for a long time uh and it's various things and there were some things that i very much liked about eclipse uh, in terms of its ide but then there were those days when you started eclipse and eclipse was just like eh, i don't want to run today <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to use every core you have so that I can, you know, skip every two characters. And the problem was, was that even understanding the underlying bits of Eclipse, because I had worked on other random pieces there too, was that it was hard. Like you couldn't, if a developer got stuck in that sort of loop, there was no, there was no escape latch. There was no way to get out. And... Uh, there were lots of IDs who have, have massively improved on those things. I'm not just saying the VS Code was the only one. But when those things started to happen, I think the tools that we have now sort of really propelled us to this much cleaner sort of world where your settings uh, are magically, uh, magically can be moved around. 
that was not a thing we had for a long time. <laughs> um, you know, oh, hey, here's a workflow that is custom to you, but ideally should be standard across your org. Oh, we just wrote a little internal plugin and now it's done. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, again, those things, like people go, oh, it's just how it was. That is not the way it was. This was a... <laughs> This was an undertaking of years. Uh, so it's nice to see sort of that, that we've gotten to this point. And it's only getting better now. I think we'd all agree on that. Exactly. For example, uh, personally, I like to use uh, my editor to write mark Markdown. And I write like most of my stuff in Markdown. But since I'm a developer, for example, generally a tech user or even a normal user, they get used to the idea that, that they cannot really do more than changing their tools to address what they need. But since we are web developers, what we like to do is if something is broken, we would like very much to, you know, be able to, you know, write a config file that could uh, fix it for every other project. And with, with, with writing Markdown, I always struggled with one simple single thing that I, I wanted to have that sort of thing that GitHub Markdown has, where you just select a word and just press Command K or just uh, like WordPress, when you, you just select the word and you just paste the link and it all automatically becomes a, you know, hypertext link. But with, when writing with Markdown in the editor, I had to always struggle with, you know, even if those are just two square brackets and a medium bracket and whatnot, but but by just, with VS Code, I was able to build a simple extension that I, whenever I have uh, a context of words or text selection uh, in I paste a link, I could easily, I, I could easily, you know, uh, reject it out that it is a link that I'm pasting. It actually converts it into a, you know, a Markdown link. So things like that uh, actually very much are very much helpful. And maybe nobody else uses that in my particular org, but these are settings to me are these settings to me are very important for my personal workflow. And I don't feel confined to one single project or one single IDE when I'm using this editor because of the uh, we it is architected and because I am a web developer. Yeah, it's interesting to me too. Uh, number one, because I always forget the syntax for markdown links. I always get it backwards. Like I tell myself, <laughs> like I'm just, apparently I'm markdown linked dyslexic at this point. Like I just can't, <laughs> like it's just one of those things it just annoys me. Uh, my brain does not want to accept it. So, <laughs> but I do find it interesting because it's not that we haven't had custom workflow stuff in other IDs, right? Because I, I, I used to do the same thing. Like I, I used to take, oh, hey, we have XYZ process. We all use uh, really slow, heavy IDE X. Do you have to do the same thing? Because that's the way we do things here. And I used to spend an inordinate amount of time outside of work trying to make workflows better for myself in IDEs that didn't crash on me every day. And these days, that proposition is massively simpler to do with VS Code, which, again, blows my mind because for a long time, I never thought anyone would care anymore. Um, admittedly, though, Microsoft has cared about developer tools for a very long time. You can say a lot of things about Microsoft, but when it came to actual tools that worked, Visual Studio wasn't bad either. Like, I don't actually don't have any problem with Visual Studio, not to mention VS Code, some of VS Code stuff you can get to run in Visual Studio. So, uh, that sort of gap, like the fact that gap is so close down and you can have those personal workflows that work with your corporate workflows magically makes, I don't know, it's it's as close as to a coding utopia as I think that I'm going to probably see. So <laughs> I'm, fine, I'm fine with that scenario. Exactly. For example, uh, when I was using Sublime or PHP Storm, I had settings, uh, custom settings in particular folder, folders. So what I had was a simple bash functions that I would run to sync my dot files, and it would just copy those files to GitHub. And that worked out very well for me. But when I moved on to uh, VS Code, a guy called Sean actually has built a, a you know extension called setting sync. It is an extremely basic thing to be able to, you know, sync your development workflow on another machine or for someone else. For example, like my wife is also a, you know, developer. So, so we, uh, both of us actually keep improving our workflows and we, our workflows are always synced because of that simple setting things extension. And all it really does is it put out their configuration files in the name of all of these extensions that we have installed, enabled or disabled 
and put all of that in a secret gist and that all of that but really works and uh, if you take a look at that code it is actually a very simple extension so things like that and having control on things that i never thought i would need for example i was a uh, you know terminal junkie i was always writing git uh, related commands in the terminal and i and initially when i installed vs code I, I i actually thought that this is one area that i would never use i would never use source control inside of vs code but then i found out about something called range select uh, and i had always been thinking about for example what you have is you forget to uh, write a commit message and then you make a bunch of changes and then you just write a you know most probable git commit messages for message for your you know commit but there are always things that are not related to your git commit messages for example fix a broken link but <laughs> that git commit message also hit a javascript file where you you know maybe auto formatted something and you can see uh, this kind of you know commit messages all over github in all kind of repositories but with green select what you can do is even in a single file you can actually select that i added this one uh, single function which is comprised of these five lines and it has a different commit message than uh, with other lines of uh, same file so that blew my mind and i actually use uh, you know the vs code git uh, extension or whatever you want to call it that git view for that particular thing whenever i forget writing a git commit message i go to the diff editor which is uh, you know a blessing in disguise for vs code and i actually select the parts of code that are relevant to a particular git commit message so that just works it's the little so, things right it yeah. just is <laughs> Yeah. So for somebody like me, who's never written anything, uh, never written an extension or a theme or anything like that. And obviously, you know, listening to, to you guys chat and hopefully other people listening will be, will think, we're thinking now of all of those little problems that they've had in their workflows before and are now starting to think, maybe I can actually solve this by kind of writing an extension for VS Code. Where is a good place to get started? Is Obviously, we've said the documentation around these things is a pretty good place. They've got some really good uh, kind of tooling, like the React uh, Create App type thing, where you can kind of get bootstrapped into building one of these things really easily. Is there any other good resources or any other good places that people should go if they're starting to think about actually creating some of these things? I personally think that the best place for this kind of stuff is actually the VS Code website. Uh, on the header, you can see the links to docs, updates, blog, API extensions, and frequently asked questions and whatnot. Uh, and beyond that, uh, I think there's an awesome VS Code repository on GitHub, which has a lot of links uh, to which are categorized related to, you know, if you are into building extensions, that would have a couple of links related to that. But mostly, uh, uh, some of these resources are kind of like outdated, but as far as the human generator for VS Code is concerned, it keeps growing and it it it, it like it has like an update every other month. So I would recommend that if you are building an extension for VS Code or a theme for VS Code, you'd start there and instead of you know just looking at the code of someone else's theme or uh, extension, because it would uh, generate a general uh, you know general boilerplate for you which would be up to date with the recent changes and the API uh, related changes. Plus it would also build a sort of a, you know, build workflow for you. Yeah, I, I would, I, I would second that the fact that, so there are lots and lots of plugins on GitHub that people have written. Um, some are, some are in the older style, some are in the newer style. Um, the samples are really good. I, I would always start with the samples because they're the most up-to-date for sure. Uh, there are links to the repos and the docs. Uh, those are generally how I started looking at stuff was I wonder how this works. And then sure enough, someone had a base sample that you can sort of just fork out and then play with instantly. And then within VS Code. Um, same thing too, is that if you just want to get started like writing interesting stuff, uh, you don't even need to start code wise like you can use the task subsystem you can use a lot of the internals of vs code just by yourself to get a feel of like how vs code operates amongst both within itself and also on your system itself so if you have you know tooling you want to run or bash scripts as, as, as have been mentioned like all those things you can do without having to you know 
read a stack of documentation. Like you can get started real quick and then you can sort of extend those into the extension world. So that was how I started the snippets one is that I had stacks and stacks of snippets that I used as quick shortcuts when I was building lots of components. And I thought, wow, I wonder if other people would like these. So I just generated that into basically a snippet plugin that you can run and magically gen snippets in. Um, those little things like that, again, it's like, it just, you don't have to dive all the way into the deep end, right? And a lot of systems you do, right? Because that's the only way you can write something. With VS Code, that's not the case. You can just go in and say, okay, what do I want to do today? What's my little plan? Um, and then from there, you can expand it into, you know, however big you want the horizon to be. But definitely the docs to start with. Um, there are, I'm trying to think, there, there's a few blog posts here and there, um, We'll have to stick some in the show notes, but the the docs are def the docs are very good. Like their change logs are amazing. I know we, when Kenneth's here, we I gushed about them again, but I'm going to gush about them now again too. The change logs that <laughs> that they ship with every build of VS Code is just uh it, it's it's the one yeah. change log I read. Right, <laughs> like, I don't know about you guys, but I read it all the time because that change log. I'm just like I didn't even think about that. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with you, but but for someone who is you know like starting out with VS Code, I would like to like mention two things here. Uh, for example, uh, or like like three things. For example, with other editors, I found that the settings area or the keyboard shortcuts area are not really well thought out, and they are just some areas that you visit once in a while or a couple of times in a year. But with VS Code, you really need to take a deeper look on how settings work how keyboard shortcuts work and how debugging works because these are really really powerful tools inside built inside of vs code the keyboard shortcuts uh, areas is like a whole keyboard uh, shortcuts editor it has context specific things and whatnot and there are you know developer tools if you just open command palette and write developer in it you will find a range of you know developer related tools for example you can actually inspect an element you can inspect a context of where you are just by clicking a pixel. Uh, okay, it will it will just throw out a JavaScript object uh, inside of you know Chrome Developer Tools that you can read to find out what kind of context you are in. And if you would like to create a you know shortcut just for this particular context, for example, when you are at the end of a particular link list inside the language which is Markdown, and you would like to you know create a sublist. What would creating a shortcut for that particular part look like? Because VS Code can really enable you to do that. And then there is a repository called Debugging Recipes uh, by Microsoft, where you will find a lot of uh, you know debugging recipes related to JavaScript apps, to Go and Python and whatnot. Uh, and uh, the debugging inside VS Code is just a single uh, JSON file called launch.json, and you will find a lot of debugging recipes in there. So if you are moving, if you are making an effort of moving from something like Sublime, which is an editor, to something like an IDE, which is VS Code, just take a look around how debugging works in VS Code. VS Code just does not just offer debugging. It actually makes it easier to debug things. It makes it easier for, you know, for example, I, will, I, I love writing, I love using serverless uh, framework for writing serverless functions, but with VS Code, writing or creating an Azure serverless function is extremely easy. Or creating a Docker file with the Docker extension is extremely easy. So, you know, definitely look into those parts of VS Code. Fantastic. Well, we're just about against time at this point. Uh, is there anything we have not particularly asked that we should, probably should have asked about VS Code? Because I feel like we've covered a lot of ground but you know, there's always the one thing. What, what have we forgot to mention? I don't know. I think we have <laughs> got everything covered. If you if you would like to use VS Code on your web, you can use Monaco Editor. If you would like to build, you know, uh, VS Code extensions, you would you would have to use, uh, you know, installed an npm based generator co hyphen code, which is based on Yoban. And uh, VS Code has a really uh, good Twitter account. And the community around it is really, you know, uh, excited about all of these new release updates that you just talked about. So, and they, they actually hear your problems. You will actually see things that did not work in the last release fixed in every single month. They follow a very transparent 
uh, open source based workflow if you would like to help them uh, in you know building VS Code. Uh, so community is a huge part of what VS Code is. And if you are like me, if you are a developer advocate, you might want to you know take a look at uh, VS Code uh, or Visual Live Share extension that actually works with Visual Studio as well as Visual Studio Code. Uh, where you can just jump right into another person's Visual Studio Code with your own keyboard shortcuts, your own workflows, and debug their application remotely. So that that works uh, really well in the you know a workshop setting with 120 people. Yeah, that feature is trick. I like that feature too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, if people want to find you on the interviews and what, uh, whatnot, uh, we'll make sure to put a link to your website. What's, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Twitter, those sorts of things? Yeah, I'm most active on Twitter. I use it like a blog. So, uh, I am M-R-A-H-M-A-D-A-W-A-I-S, Mr. M-L-O-S on Twitter. Uh, let's be friends there. <laughs> Fantastic. And we'll make sure to get that in the notes as well. Leon, closing thoughts before we wrap up episode number 189 of the Web Platform Podcast. I've got a list of things I want to make extensions for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I can see what we're doing the next month. <laughs> yeah, maybe the next month's Web Notes would be in a VS Code extension from now on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to stick Danny's face everywhere. We'll just, <laughs> Danny pops up and goes, no, and then just hides. I don't know why that needs to be an extension, but I feel like it does. I think it definitely does. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. Uh, this has been episode number 189 of the Web Platform Podcast. Today, we've been talking with him about uh, developing with VS Code and all the wonderful things you can build in VS Code with VS Code. And it's just a, a magical place where your developer experience gets a little bit better. Tune in next week when we talk more things web, more things platform, more things awesome developer -y. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your week. <laughs>